So today I'm going to be presenting a talk called Why Theistic Evolution is Incompatible with the Bible. Notice there I said why theistic evolution is incompatible with the Bible. We're not going to be looking at the, the science today, but we're going to be looking at why um, theistic evolution does not fit with biblical teaching. You know, there are many people in the church today who want to say God used evolution to create the world, but we would say, no, that's not what scripture teaches. In fact, it really, when you understand it, erodes the teaching of scripture. So this is the subject we're going to be looking at today. If you want to look more into the science and why science actually falsifies Darwinian evolution, then I would recommend uh, the book Replacing Darwin or the smaller version Replacing Darwin Made Simple by um, our geneticist, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, who got his PhD in, in genetics from Harvard University. And that is a great critique of the theory of Darwinian evolution. And he makes plenty of predicted um, predictions in, in those booklets and that book um, to help us understand the biblical worldview and why that refutes, science refutes um, Darwinian evolution. So if you want the scientific aspect, then I recommend uh, the book Replacing Darwin and the smaller version Replacing Darwin Made Simple. But in order to understand the foundation of uh, evolution, then we really need to understand why the great age of the earth is so important as, as its foundation. Because Ernst Mayer, a famous biologist, evolutionary biologist in the 20th century, who wrote a paper, The Nature of the Darwinian Revolution, said this, the Darwinian Revolution began when it became obvious that the earth was very ancient rather than having been created only 6,000 years ago. This finding was the snowball that started the whole avalanche. And so Mayer points to the fact that when um, it, it became obvious from, from a Darwinian point of view, not from a scientific point of view, that the world was very old, then he says this was what started the whole avalanche against the biblical teaching of the earth being around 6,000 years old. So we need to understand that the great age of the earth plays such a foundational role in Darwinian evolution. In fact, when we look um, at the fossil record, the evolutionists basically teach that those layers were formed very slowly over millions of years. But from a biblical perspective, we would argue, no, they occurred. Most of the fossil record, the vast majority of it took place, um, occurred, was laid down during Noah's flood. But two men who really helped push this idea of the great age of the earth in the 18th and 19th century were men by the names of James Hutton and Charles Lyell. They both came from Scotland, were amateur geologists. Um, Lyell was a lawyer um, by training, but they really helped to push the idea of the great age of the earth. In fact, Charles Lyell um, in his books really influenced Darwin in his thinking, and we'll talk about that in a second. But James Hutton said in uh, a paper, The Theory of the Earth, the past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe, no action to be admitted except those of which we know the principle. So what's Hutton telling us there? He says, when you look as a scientist at the rock layers, you basically have to understand them by what can be happening now. In other words, slow, gradual processes. You have to appeal to present day processes to understand the rock layers. And then he says, no powers are to be employed that are not natural. Now, why does he say that? Because in his day, there were people known as the scriptural geologists who um, believed the Bible and they believed the rock layers were laid down through Noah's flood. But Hutton's really laying a philosophy that he wants people to interpret the data by to say, no, you have to interpret things um, naturally. You can't appeal to supernatural revelation. And so we need to to know that these ideas have basically dominated the science of geology for the last 200 years by interpreting the rock layers by what can be seen to be happening now. And it has to be a natural explanation. That's a philosophy pushed upon science. It doesn't come from observational science. And that really laid the groundwork for what we call today the idea of uniformitarianism, which is the idea that the present is the key to the past. If you want to understand the past world, then you need to understand what is happening in the present world. And so 
Peter, if you've ever read um, 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about the scoffers in the last day. And he says that when they come, they'll say all things continue as they were from the beginning. That's basically the same idea, the idea of uniformitarianism. It's not a, a new idea. Many of the Greek philosophy uh, philosophers of Peter's day believed in the, a similar concept of uniformitarianism. But Peter tells us that when those scoffers come, how does he refute them? Well, he appeals to biblical creation. He appeals to the supernatural creation of the world and its destruction by a global flood. So if you want to destroy the philosophy of uniformitarianism, then you need to understand the supernatural creation of the world and its destruction through a global flood. But like I said, those men, Hutton and Lyle, really influenced Charles Darwin. In fact, when Darwin went on his famous um, voyage of the Beagle um, in, in the 1800s, he took on board Charles Lyle's books, which influenced him in his thinking about the age of the earth. And so he had that idea in his mind when he wrote The Origin of Species in 1859, which he was basically proposing that we come from a common ancestor uh, millions of years ago. And then it was in his book, The Descent of Man, which he wrote in 1871, where he pro proposed the idea that our early progenitors lived on the African continent. And that's where today people will argue that mankind came out of the, we came out of Af the African continent in an evolutionary world view. And so that's the basic idea of evolution. And today, sadly, there are many Christians promoting this idea of theistic evolution. You can see there on the screen, you might recognize a number of those theologians, apologists, scientists who all claim to be Christians. Dennis Lamoureux, who um, is a famous scientist um, and theologian from Canada. Dennis Alexander um, is a famous scientist in the UK. He works for the Faraday Institute. Francis Collins was picked by um, Barack Obama, your former president, to lead the Human Genome Project. Dennis Venema is a scientist biologist at um, the theistic evolutionary think tank Biologos. N.T. Wright is one of the world's leading New Testament scholars in the UK. And then you have apologists like Os Guinness, preachers like Tim Keller, again, apologists like William Lane Craig, and Old Testament scholars like Tremper Longman and John Walton, all pushing in their apologetics, in their writings, that the idea that God used evolution to create the world. And so we need to understand that there are many believers out there who are pushing this idea of theistic evolution. But first of all, we need to think about what is theistic evolution? Well, in an article on the website Biologos, Dennis Venema argued this about theistic evolution. He explained it this way. This view holds that science is not an enemy to be fought, but rather a means of understanding some of the mechanisms God has used to bring about biodiversity on the earth. This view accepts that humans share ancestry with all other forms of life and that our species arose as a population and not through a single pair. And so that's basically the evolution, a theistic evolutionary world view. But notice that um, Venema tells us this view holds that science is not an enemy to be fought. Well, who believes science is an enemy to be fought? Because young earth creationists don't see science as the enemy. But we do understand that science is interpreted through a world view. And that's important to understand. You know, there's an important distinction also that we need to understand when it comes to science, what we call experimental or observational science, which come, came about in the, the 16th century through the, the time of the Reformation, through a Christian worldview. Modern science arose in the 16th century because of the Reformation and belief in God's word. And that gave rise to many of the branches of modern science that we see today. But that's what we call experimental or observational science, which is using your five senses in the present to go out and observe the world which God has made. As creationists, we believe in observational science. In fact, many of the scientists' answers in Genesis do great observational science. We don't reject science. What we reject is a form of science called origins or historical science, which is your belief about the past when you weren't there to see what went, what went on. For example, who was there to see the Big Bang in an evolutionary worldview? No one. There was no scientist around. It's not observable. It's not repeatable. And you cannot test it. Or when it comes to the origin of life or when it comes to 
um, common descent. Who was there to see that? No one was. It's not a, a, an observational uh, model of science, but we also need really to realize that when it comes to creation, creation is also historical science. But what we argue for as Christians, that we have an eyewitness record in God's word, the Bible. God has told us uh, some of the details of what he has done in the past. And so the evolutionary um, view of the history of man basically boils down to this, that, this, that human split from chimpanzees around 3 million years ago. And then modern humans evolved somewhere in Africa around 100,000 to 200,000 years ago from a population of people, not two people, as Venema um, said, from a population of two people. And even um, evolutionists will disagree among themselves whether that's 100,000 to 200 thousand years ago but the biblical history of man is very different when you read um, Genesis according to its literature in its context then biblically then Adam and Eve were created supernaturally on day six of creation week and then the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 give an unbroken chronology that tell us that creation occurred around 6,000 years ago and you can see that from um, the New Testament when Jude tells us in Jude verse 14 that Enoch was the seventh from Adam. So whereas many people today want to try and argue, well, there's gaps in the genealogies, the New Testament writers did not take the genealogies in Genesis 5 like that. They saw um, them with, as an unbroken chronology, and that's how we should see them as well. But let's quickly look at what theistic evolutionists believe about scripture and about the Bible and when it comes to Genesis. Firstly, the theistic evolutionists would teach that Genesis 1 to 11 teaches theology and not history. So it's not given as historical information. And then Genesis 1 to 11 reflects the worldview of ancient Near Eastern literature. There are many Old Testament scholars today pushing this view that Genesis, if you're going to understand Genesis, then you first need to understand um, the worldview of ancient Near Eastern literature. Then they teach that Genesis 1 and 2 are contra contradictory accounts of creation. You know, right at the beginning of the Bible, they would say you have two contradictory accounts of the creation of the world. And then they would argue general revelation, that's God's revelation and creation, is placed in the same category as special revelation scripture. And so we're going to look at these arguments now and see if they hold water so we're going to look at now is genesis history does genesis teach history and we would say yes it does but it doesn't just teach history it teaches theology as well because it tells us about god who god is tells us about man and the nature of man his original creation and his fall so it doesn't just teach history it does teach theology but it does teach history Genesis is history. And we know this, for example, in Genesis 1 and throughout Genesis 1 to 11, but specifically in Genesis 1, it uses the Hebrew verb form, the Vav Kital, which is a standard marker of historical narrative in the Old Testament. So the grammar, the verb forms in Genesis 1 are standard uh, markers of historical narrative in the rest of the Old Testament. The Vav Kital is basically when you read, and God said, and, and God did this it pushes the narrative forward. So the verb form used in Genesis 1 is used elsewhere in the Old Testament of a historical um, narrative. And then we have the Toledot headings in Genesis. These are historical markers. If you read in Genesis 2.4, it tells us this is the generations of, or this is the history of, depending upon your translation of the Bible. And they don't just occur in um, Genesis 1 to 11, as you can see there on the screen, they occur, they occur even after Genesis 1 to 11 throughout the book of Genesis. And no one would say after Genesis 11 or the patriarchs is not historical. And so if you treat Genesis 12 to 50 as historical, which is the same language as Genesis 1 to 11, then you need to understand that Genesis 1 to 11 is also history. We can see that through the Toledot headings. And we know that Genesis um, 1 is not poetic. It lacks, for example, parallelism that you see in the, Psalms, in the Psalms. You know, Genesis doesn't use things like metaphors or figures of speech, which would be commonplace in 
the Psalms, you know, there is um, a poetic description, for example, in Genesis 2, when God creates Eve from Adam's side and Adam then sees Eve and he, and he, and he blurts out this poem, which is understandable given the context when he sees Eve for the first time. But poetry is lacking in Genesis 1 to 11. It is not a poem. For example, if you look at the Psalm, Psalm 92, 1 to, uh, 1 to 2, it tells us this, it is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. It, it repeats, um, it tells us one thing, then repeats it in a different way. That's what you see in the Psalms. It's called parallelism. And parallelism is lacking in Genesis 1. It is, it's a, it, this is um, a standard marker in, in poetry, in the Psalms, in, in Proverbs, in the wisdom literature, but it's not there in Genesis one but then people will say well genesis one has a particular structure which is very much poetic for example they bring up many theistic evolutionists bring up this argument they'll say well look at this structure that you can see there on the screen that's there in genesis and therefore it's clearly a case of structural parallelism for example you can see on day one god creates the heaven and then they say that's compared to day four where the sun moon and stars are created to go in the heavens day two water and sky, um, which is, is paralleled with day five, the birds and the sea creatures are meant to fill the water and the sky. And then day three, we have the land and plants created, which on day six, the land and animals uh, are compared to there. And people say, well, this is an example of structural parallelism. Well, let's just look at the details. For example, the sun, moon and stars on day four were placed in the expanse on day two, not on day one. So that doesn't match up already. Then the fish on day five fill the waters on day one of the seas on day three and not the separated waters on day two. Nothing was made on day six to fill the seas on day three and the earth was made on day one, but nothing on day four filled the earth that was made on day one. And so when you look at the details, people often say the devil is in the details. Well, no, he's not. It's God who's in the details. And we need to check these details out because it shows that structural parallelism is not there in the book of Genesis. So the book of Genesis is lacking those things. Another reason why Genesis is history is creation like the, vir like the virgin birth or the resurrection was a supernatural event. We need to know that when God created the world, it's, it's not, he didn't use the current day processes that we see, then the, the way God runs the world today. It was a supernatural creation of the world. God spoke and things came in to be. And that's what the Psalms tell us, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were created. And we see that again in John 1, where the word Lord Jesus Christ is the creator of all things, which is echoed in Hebrews um, 2, uh, chapter 1, verses 2. And three, so God spoke creation into existence and different things on different days. It was a supernatural event. It was not a repeatable event. God did that one time in history. And then we know as well from the commandments, the fourth commandment in Exodus 20, 11, for in six days, the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. That's a clear um, testimony from God that he created the world in six normal 24 hour days. And then we have the testimony of Jesus and the apostles, because when they interpret the creation and the flood, they interpret it as history. They don't try and mythologize it. They don't try and allegorize it. They don't treat it as poetry. They understand creation and the flood as historical events and you've got to remember if jesus is our lord if he is our savior then we need to read scripture as jesus reads scripture and so those are the reasons why we believe genesis is history now let's look at the question should we interpret genesis according to ancient near eastern worldview well first of all we need to think about what is the ancient near east because you might never have heard of this argument well the ancient near east is basically the land there you can see on the screen, what we would know as Syria, Babylon, and Egypt. And it's the writings that archeologists discovered in that land um, where we found other 
creation and flood accounts where people say, well, you have to understand those accounts in order to understand the biblical account. For example, if you've ever heard of the Gilgamesh and Atrahasip epic, those are other accounts from the from, um, Mesopotamia that speak of creation and the flood. And those were written um, around 1800 to 1600 BC, so in the second millennium BC. And they, and they are similar to the creation and flood account. And many scholars today are using those ancient Near Eastern texts to look through and read the Bible. But we mustn't do that because, as we'll see, those worldviews, the worldview between the biblical worldview and the ancient Near Eastern worldview are very different. In fact, we shouldn't be scared of these texts. We shouldn't be even intimidated by these texts because when we understand what the Bible tells us, we can understand why these other creation accounts and flood accounts exist in the world. And by the way, they don't just exist in the ancient Near East. Just about every culture in the world has a creation and flood account. And this is understandable from the biblical worldview. If you understand the Tower of Babel and what happens at the Tower of Babel when God dispersed people groups around the world, well, what would have happened? They would have taken the memory of creation, the memory of flood that would have been passed down through people like Noah and his sons, and they would have um, distorted that true account of creation and the flood. They would have vulgarized it and distorted it according to their pagan world views, which is why we have these other accounts in the world. So we shouldn't be surprised when we find these other accounts in the world, but we should understand them through a biblical world view. In fact, when you go into many museums around the world, this is a picture of the Sumerian king list from a museum in Oxford, England of, this, of the Sumerian king list in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And you can see there at the bottom of the king list, there's a description. And on the description of the king list, it tells us this. This is the first side of the Sumerian king list, written in around 1800 BC. It mentions a legendary flood in Mesopotamia. Multiple or single events in prehistory may have inspired this story, in turn inspiring the biblical flood story in the book of Genesis. And so what um, are the people at the museum trying to tell us? Basically, that Genesis, the Genesis account of the flood is not original. They got that flood account from the Mesopotamian flood accounts. In other words, they borrowed that worldview. They, um, they borrowed that story. And, but that's not at all accurate history. Because when you compare the ancient Near Eastern flood myths with the biblical account, they do have similarities, but here's the thing, that there are many differences and the differences outweigh the similarities and the differences would point to the fact they could not have come um, from one another. For example, in the Mesopotamian accounts, overpopulation or humanity's noise interrupts the sleep of the gods and causes the flood. That's not the reason why the flood takes place in Genesis. For example, why does the flood occur in Genesis? Because of the wickedness, because of the corruption of mankind. That's why God sends the flood, not because people are being too loud. In the Gilgamesh epic, the gods were terrified at the flood and cowered like dogs. When God sends the flood in Genesis, he's not afraid of the flood. He's sovereign over the whole world. He is sovereign over entire creation and he sends the flood and he's not afraid of the flood. In the Mesopotamian text, the decisions of the God but to have been kept secret from man. In other words, the gods didn't tell the people that the flood was coming. But in Genesis, God speaks to Noah directly seven times, telling him about the flood. And so God doesn't keep the secret from the flood a secret from Noah. In the Mesopotamian accounts, the builders of the vessel, the boatmen, relatives and friends and passengers are passengers with the hero and his family. But notice in the biblical account, it's only Noah and his family who get on to the ark. And then possibly the, the biggest difference is the fact that in the two accounts, it's the Bible's investing the story with a covenant concept. You'll only find the concept of covenant there in the biblical text. That's missing from those ancient Near Eastern texts. And that's important because God makes a covenant with Noah never to destroy the world 
again, that covenant concept. A covenant is a binding agreement between two parties, and God gives a covenant to Noah and to creation that he would never destroy the world again. But those aren't the only differences, because another major difference is the size and shape of the ark. For example, um, the Epic of Gilgamesh comes from a 12-tablet poem and is the most cited myth used to discredit the biblical account of Noah. This ancient story features a cube-shaped ark, a cube-shaped ark, 200 feet in length, width, and height. And when you think about that, a cube-shaped ark makes no sense. It would be destroyed in a flood. It would not survive the flood. But we know that it's not true of the biblical ark because the biblical ark was um, 510 feet by 85 feet and 51 feet, which is um, a, a brilliant way to build the ark. And, and scientists have even tested that model, that length and, and, and depth and height of the ark. And they've told us that it gives us the maximum stability, the maximum strength, and the maximum comfort for that shape of the ark. Noah's ark is perfectly balanced to survive um, the flood. But we need to understand that the ancient Near Eastern worldview and the biblical worldview are two diametrically opposed ways of thinking about reality. For example, the ancient Near Eastern texts are polytheistic. In other words, there's, there's many gods in those accounts, whereas the biblical account is monotheistic. There's only one true and living God. In the ancient Near Eastern worldview, there's an eternity of chaotic, chaotic matter. In other words, matter has always existed, whereas in the biblical worldview, matter is created. God exists before the creation of the world and he forms the world. He brings matter into existence. In the ancient Near Eastern worldview, they have a low view of the gods. The gods are not like the biblical gods. It's a low view of the gods. They're always fighting and arguing with each other. Whereas in the biblical view, there's a very high view of God as the creator and sovereign ruler of his creation. And then in the ancient Near Eastern worldview, conflict is the source of life. You know, the gods fight and control over each, each other and try and do that to create the world. In fact, that's how the world is created in the ancient, many of the ancient Near Eastern texts. Gods fight with each other to create the world. Whereas in the biblical worldview, God speaks creation into existence. He is not in conflict with himself. The triune God is in harmony when he creates the world. In the ancient Near Eastern worldview, there's a low view of humanity. Humanity is a slave to the gods, whereas in the biblical worldview, we have this radical worldview where man is made in the image of God. Man is unique. God um, blesses him and tells him to have dominion over creation. Man is made in the image of God. And then... Lastly, there's what we call a cyclical concept of existence in the ancient Near Eastern worldviews. You know, the world just goes round and round and round. There's no beginning, there's no end. Whereas in the Bible, there's a linear concept of existence. What do we mean by that? Well, we have creation, we have the fall of man, we have redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then one day we look forward to the end of human history when God will create a new heavens and a new earth earth those are very the two very different ways of thinking about reality and so we need to remember to look through those texts through the lens of authoritative scripture god breathed scripture you know some people say well in the past people couldn't distinguish between truth and myth but that's not true because we see this in the new testament when paul writes to timothy in 2 timothy 4 4 paul tells um, Timothy about the last days where people will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. So people in the past could distinguish between truth and myth. And the Bible tells us to distinguish between those two things. Now let's look at this question and Genesis one and two contradictory accounts of creation. Cause this is a popular argument given by just about every theistic evolutionist. And why do they do this? Well, have this argument. In Genesis 1, we see that plants are created before Adam 
on day three. Adam is made on day six and the plants are made on day three. But in Genesis two, no plants, uh, there were no plants when God created Adam. It tells us that in Genesis two, five, there was no um, small plant or shrub of the ground when, um, before God created Adam. And then in Genesis one, animals are created before Adam on day six. God first creates the animals and then he creates Adam. But in Genesis two, Adam is formed before the animals. And then in Genesis one, the name for God that is used there is the name Elohim, which is like a transcendent name for God. But in Genesis two, the name for God is Yahweh and is combined with Elohim. We, we, we read that the phrase, the Lord God said, that's Yahweh Elohim. And so people say, when you look at those things, that tells us those are two contradictory accounts of creation. But again, this fails to look at the details of the text. There is no contradiction between Genesis 1 and 2. For example, Genesis 1 is about the creation of the world in six days. It's the big picture view of creation. It's sort of like this wide angle view of creation of the world in six days. Then Genesis 2 focuses in um, like a camera with a zoom lens focusing in on something. Genesis 2 focuses in on the Garden of Eden because man is created in God's image on day six. So Genesis 2 is specifically looking at the, the day six of creation when man is made in the Garden of Eden. So you first need to understand the context of each chapter. And so when you look at Genesis 2, the shrub and the plant of 2.5, Genesis 2.5, are not the same as the vegetation of Genesis 1, um, 11 to 12 on day three. The, the vegetation on Genesis, in Genesis 1 and day three is supernaturally comes up from the ground like this, whereas the shrub and the plant in Genesis chapter 2 tells us has to be worked from the ground. Genesis 2.5 looks forward to the, the fall of man in Genesis chapter three, where Adam will have to work the ground for his food. And then what about the, 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 the animals being formed before Adam in Genesis one? Well, in Genesis two nineteen, some scholars translate the verb had formed as a pluperfect. What do we mean by that? In other words, it's the past event, the past of the past. It happened in the past. Okay. Or there's another um, idea that the animals that God creates there after Adam could refer to a special group of animals formed only in the Garden of Eden. And, and when you read Genesis 2, Adam doesn't have to name all the animals that God created. He only has, has to name the livestock and the beasts of the field and the birds of the earth. So he doesn't have to name all the animals. So it's probably pointless to a specific group of animals formed in the garden. And then Genesis 2 brings together the title of the transcendent God, Elohim, with the title of the personal name for God, Yahweh, because it's God who now comes to make Adam and in a relationship with him and creates him in a covenant. It's God's personal name. So it's not a contradiction between one God in Genesis 2 and another God in, in, in Genesis 1. No, it's the same God. And that's what the author is saying. The, 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 the God Elohim is the same God Yahweh who makes his covenant with man. So there's no contradiction there between Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two. And what about this idea that there are two books of revelation? Some people talk about this two books concept, the book of nature and the book of scripture. In fact, Francis Collins that theistic evolutionist who wrote the book, The Language of God, said this, I do not believe that God who created all the universe would expect us to deny the obvious truths of the natural world that science has revealed to us. Well, I don't believe God would want us to deny what we see in the natural world, but we need to understand that what we see in the natural world is interpreted through a lens. We all have a bias. We all have a worldview, whether you're a creationist or evolutionist, we all have a starting point, a foundation by which we interpret the evidence. And so if you're a theistic evolutionist, you look at the, the world through the lens, first and foremost, through an evolutionary worldview. But if you're a biblical creationist, we need to remember that God's word is the foundation in our thinking, and we interpret the world accordingly. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not a matter of denying obvious truths in nature, because we would say that you need to understand those truths 
are interpreted according to a world view. And we need to re remember that sin has affected how we think about the world. In Romans chapter one, Paul talks about humanity who suppress the truth of God's revelation in creation as futile in their thinking, and they have a debased mind, which is why we need um, a, a mind to be our minds to be renewed by Scripture. First of all, we need a renewed mind, and so we need to know the Bible talks about our mind as being sinful before we are new creatures in Christ. We're futile in our thinking, and we have a debased mind. In fact. Louis Burkhoff, a famous reformed theologian, said this, some are inclined to speak of God's general revelation as a second source, but this is hardly correct in view of the fact that nature can come into consideration here only as interpreted in the light of scripture. And then he goes on to say, since the entrance of sin into the world, man can gather true knowledge about God from his general revelation only if he studies it in light of scripture in which the elements of God's original self-revelation, which are obscured and perverted by the blight of sin, are republished, corrected, and interpreted. And so we would agree with Burkhoff there that you can only understand what we see in God's world when we look at it through the lens of scripture, because the world around us is cursed, whereas God's revelation in scripture is not cursed. And so we need the perfect word of God to understand the fallen creation in which we live. And so now we're going to look at um, a number of ways in which theistic evolution is incompatible with biblical teaching. Firstly, that there is no death of any kind in God's original creation. Theistic evolutionists would argue, well, death and suffering have always been in existence because that's the way in which evolution works. In fact, things like brain tumors, cancers, arthritis are found by secular science, which they date to be millions of years old, back there in the fossil record. They find diseases that we have today, such as brain tumors and cancers, in the fossil record, which they date to be millions of years old. But this doesn't fit with what the Bible tells us about God's creation, because in Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and 30, the Bible tells us originally that the animals and man were created to be vegetarian. They're eating the fruit and they're eating the plants for food. There's no killer be killed in God's world. There's no survival of the fittest. There's no death or suffering in that world. In fact, God just doesn't call everything good in his creation. In Genesis 1.31, he tells us that God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. But what does very good mean? Well, we'll look at this now. How was creation very good? Well, it fulfilled the purpose for which God made it to function for. The creation had a purpose to function. You know, in, God, in Genesis um, chapter one and day three, God forms the plants ready on day three to be put there so man can eat them on day six. Creation fulfills the purposes which God made it to function for. And the same with the sun, moon, and stars on day four. They were there prepared, ready for, for Adam and Eve on day six. And creation is very good in the sense that it's complete and lacks nothing that it was intended for. And it's also um, morally good. The completed creation is also morally good. In fact, a critical scholar, a very famous critical scholar of the Bible, um, Gerhard von Radage, a German scholar, who wrote in his Genesis commentary in the 1960s, referred to, or commented rather, on Genesis 1.31. He said this, expressed and written in a world full of innumerable troubles, perverses and inalienable concern of faith. No evil was laid upon the world by God's hand. Neither was his omnipotence limited by any kind of opposing power, whatever. When faith speaks of creation, and in doing so directs its eye toward God, then it can only say that God created the world perfect. And so he's a critical scholar who wouldn't believe, um, in fact, he would be a theistic evolutionist, who says that if you just look at the text, it's telling us that God created the world with no evil in it, and that it was perfect, or we would say a better choice of words would be very good, because it, the, the, the Hebrew doesn't use the, word, the Hebrew word for perfect, but he's a he's a theistic evolutionist, a critical scholar of the Bible, who would say that when you read the text of Genesis 1:31, that is what it is implying. There was no death or suffering in God's very good world. It was morally 
um, perfect. So when you look at this picture, for example, here you have Adam and Eve in conversation and um, Eve says to Adam, oh, Adam, this is such a perfect world. Yes, Eve, it's very good, just like God said. Well, for a theistic evolution, that's contradictory because there you would have all the fossil record beneath them with a history of death, suffering, killing, disease, you know, and extinction. How would that be very good? It doesn't make sense from a biblical point of view. The next point is that physical death is a consequence of the fall of Adam. This is a clear biblical teaching, but a lot of theistic evolutionists struggle with this because they already believe death was present in creation. So therefore they have to reinterpret what the text of scripture says. For example, Dennis Alexander, who I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, said this in an English newspaper a number of years ago, and he's talking about the doctrine of original sin, but he says this, nowhere does the Bible teach that physical death originates with the sin of Adam. Nowhere does the Bible teach that the physical de death originates with the sin of Adam. You know, when I, when I read that, I thought, what Bible is he reading? Because it's obvious in scripture that physical death originates with the sin of Adam. What he's having to do is having to reinterpret scripture because of his evolutionary presuppositions. For example, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, God speaks to Adam and says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And in the Hebrew it reads like, Die and you shall die. It's the process of death that comes into existence the day Adam disobeys God. And that includes both physical and physical and spiritual death. The Bible doesn't separate those two things out because we know in Genesis 3.19 that when Adam disobeyed God, God tells Adam, for dust you are, to dust you shall return. Adam went physically back to the dust of the ground. And then in Romans 5.12, the apostle Paul commentates basically on Genesis chapter 3 where he tells us, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sinned and so the reason why we see death in the world paul tells us is because of what adam did in genesis chapter 3 and paul here is talking in context about human death and so this is the picture we see when we understand the biblical text that man's actions brought sin and death into creation and paul further talks about the fact that for if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man paul talks about the reign of death which is of course physical death because when you read genesis 5 what do you read you read of adam's descendants and he died and he died and he died all the way through genesis 5 it's a history of death all adam's descendants died that's the reign of death that you see in scripture and that's going back to genesis 3 because of adam's sin the reason seth enosh and Noah would all die is because of Adam's sin, because Adam is the head of the human race and we are in Adam. That's the reign of death that Paul talks about. But Paul doesn't only say it's human death that came into creation because he mentions in Romans 8.22 that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Creation is suffering and groaning in pain, not because of the way the world works because of evolution but because of sin adam in in hebrew the, the name for adam in hebrew is adam and he is taken out of the dust of the ground and the word for ground in hebrew is adamah so adam comes from the adamah so when adam sinned his sin affected the entire creation not just the humanity but it infected the entire creation which is why we see things like tsunamis earthquakes natural disasters in the world. God isn't to blame for those things. Man is to blame scripturally for those things. And Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, in the context of just talking about Adam, he tells us the last enemy to be destroyed is death. In the biblical worldview, death is an enemy. It's not natural to creation. Paul tells us death is an enemy. It's the last enemy to be destroyed. It's an intruder to God's very good creation. So those two views of history, millions of years of death, suffering, and disease, leading to man's existence, 
whereas the biblical view is man's sin bringing death into the world are two completely direct um, opposed ideas that cannot be brought together you know whereas many theistic evolutionists want to say yeah god used evolution it's the atheists it's the skeptics of the age that often point the, the contradiction out that god wouldn't have used evolution it makes no sense i want you to listen to um, a clip now of an atheist called jerry coin and he's in conversation with a with a christian and listen to what he tells us about evolution evolution is unique amongst the sciences because it strikes people on the solar plexus of their faith directly it strikes them in the idea that they're specially created by god because evolution says you're not it says that um there's no special purpose for your life because it's a naturalistic philosophy we have no more extrinsic purpose than a squirrel or an armadillo and it says that morality does not come from god it is an evolved phenomenon and those are three things that are really hard for humans to accept particularly when we're brought up in a religious tradition it's interesting what jerry coin said there because he didn't he doesn't think it makes sense for to, to say god created the world through evolution rather he tells us evolution is a naturalistic philosophy naturalism there's no room for god that's what evolution is all about it's a naturalistic philosophy notes he says evolution tells us that we're not specially created we're not made in the image of god in fact he said we have no more worth or value than a squirrel or an armadillo and that's what you need to read realize about evolution it's a naturalistic philosophy putting god with it does not make any sense next problem that we see is jesus's view of creation and the flood is incompatible with a theistic evolutionary world view because when jesus spoke about creation he took the creation account as historical for example in one passage in mark 10 6 we read this when jesus is talking to the pharisees about divorce and remarriage he said this but from the beginning of creation god made them male and female and so Jesus there is talking about the original creation in Genesis chapter one. But notice Jesus talks about from the beginning of creation. Well, when was the beginning of creation? If you look at these timelines on the screen, on the top timeline, we have a biblical view of the history of the world. Adam is created on day six of creation week. Then 4,000 years later, when Christ comes into the world, that's only a short period of history but that would make sense of adam being created at the beginning of creation from a biblical worldview but from a from a evolutionary point of view the beginning of creation makes no sense if you understand what jesus is saying because the world was created 14 billion years ago in an evolutionary worldview where adam and eve came into existence 14 billion years later so for 99.99997 percent of human history man adam was not on the planet so how can that be the beginning of creation jesus refutes the idea of an old earth jesus refutes the idea of theistic evolution but evolution theistic evolutionists have a way around this because here's a quote from dennis lamoureux and he's talking about the parallel passage um, in matthew 19 verses 4 and 5 and listen to what he says he says powerful evidence for a strict literal reading of the Genesis creation accounts come from Jesus himself. However, in Matthew 19, four and five, Jesus accommodated by employing the ancient science to emphasize the inerrant spiritual truth that God is the creator of human beings. So how does Lamoro get around the fact that Jesus takes Genesis according to its literature as history? Well, he says Jesus just accommodated to the views of his time and that's another way of saying jesus was in error but jesus never accommodated to the views of his time think how many times in the gospel you read things like this where jesus is confronting the religious leaders here it's it's to do with a tradition and he talks to to them and says about in vain do they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men you leave the commandment and god and hold to the tradition of men and so jesus doesn't accommodate to the pharisees view here of um, what we call the corbin rule jesus rebukes them and says this tradition is a tradition of man in fact he goes on to say for moses said honor your father and mother where's that found that's found in the 10 
commandments, the same commandments which teach in six days God created the heaven and the earth. But notice Jesus says, for Moses said, and then in verse 13, he says, thus make and void the word of God by your tradition. And so the Pharisees made void Moses, the word of God, the Torah, through their tradition. And that's what theistic evolutionists are doing today. They're making void the word of God through their tradition. They don't want to listen to what Moses has said, what God has said in the books of Moses, because they have their tradition. But what did Jesus teach about the flood? Well, in Luke 17, Jesus makes comment about the flood when he's talking about um, the final judgment to come. And he talks about the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and they were drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Notice how Jesus treats the text of Genesis. He talks about people marrying, giving in marriage, eating and drinking, they were doing normal things. So he's reading the text as, as history, as events that took place. And then he says the flood came and destroyed them all. And the Greek word Luke uses there for flood is the word cataclysmos, which is where we get our English word cataclysm. And you don't have local cataclysm. In fact, Luke tells us that Jesus said the flood destroyed them all. So that makes no sense if the flood was local because there would have been people who survived the flood. In fact, think about it. Jesus is paralleling the judgment to come at the end of the world with the flood. And so if the final judgment is a global judgment, and it is, then in order for the analogy to work, the judgment in the days of Noah must have been a global judgment. And next, what about the inerrancy of Scripture? Because many theistic evolutionists, not all, um, would deny the inerrancy of Scripture. Most would have to do if they're being consistent. But here's a statement on the Biologos website, that theistic evolutionary think tank. They say this on the inerrancy of scripture. Some in Biologos would not be comfortable with the word inerrancy. Others would be comfortable with the Bible being inerrant in terms of what God has to teach in matters of faith and practice. In other words, they would hold to the inerrancy when the Bible talks about spiritual things, but not about historical things. But here's the thing, you cannot separate history and the spiritual things from the historical things because they're joined together in scripture. But you can see how their view of theistic evolution really destroys the inerrancy of scripture. But we need to ask this question, what was Jesus's view of scripture? Well, when you look at how Jesus took the Old Testament, he took um, the accounts as historical. Many of the, the people and the passages that are most scoffed at and as uh, by the skeptics and critics of the Bible today, the passages that Jesus accepted and taught on. For example, Jesus believed in the first man, Adam. He also believed in his son, Abel. Noah and the flood, Abraham. So he believed in the patriarchs. The account of Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus talked about that, and he took that as a historical account. Moses, whereas many scholars would want to die, deny Moses today, um, Jesus talks about Moses and that, the reason people didn't believe his words because they didn't believe Moses. And Jesus also mentioned Jonah and the great fish. Jesus didn't take that as a parable, parable or, or anything else. He understood that as a historical event. So the most attack text in scripture today are the texts Jesus took as historical. He believed in those things. Jesus talked about the word of God when he was talking to Satan in his temptation in the wilderness. And how did Jesus talk about the word of God? He answered Satan, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so Jesus talks about every word that comes from the mouth of God. All the words of scripture are God's words and belong to him. And then in Matthew 5, 18, on the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus says this, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And so Jesus didn't believe that scripture um, was only inspired in its concepts or in the spiritual things, but he believed scripture was inspired down to the very words of scripture, that even the text itself, the words of 
were inspired. Not an oath and not a dot will pass from the law. And then in John 17, 17, Jesus tells his disciples, or speaking, is, is praying to God for his disciples, praying to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus didn't say your word is true. He said your word is truth. In other words, it's the standard by which everything else needs to be measured. And think about this. If the Bible isn't inerrant, how could they be sanctified in the truth of things? You can't be sanctified in error. Jesus has sanctified them in truth. Your word is truth. You know, when you think about evolution, it's like a universal acid. And that isn't my concept. That's a, an atheist concept. The, atheist, Dan, the famous atheist philosopher Daniel Dennett described evolution as a universal acid. If you've played with acid in, in, the, in the schoolroom, the classroom, you pour evo, um, acid out, it's, it dissolves everything it comes into contact with. And that's Dennett's point, that evolution destroys all things it comes into contact with, whether that's God, meaning, morality, purpose. That's what evolution does according to Danette. In fact, Carl Guyberson, who described himself, who, who would have once said he was an evangelical, but now is no longer. He said this in his book, Saving Darwin. The next universal acid dissolved Adam and Eve. It ate through the Garden of Eden. It destroyed the historicity of the events of creation week. It etched holes in those parts of Christianity connected to these stories. The fall, Christ as the second Adam, the origins of sin, and nearly everything else I counted sacred and so you can see how evolution doesn't strengthen your faith in the bible being a theistic evolutionist it destroys the doctrines of scripture that we see there in the bible whether it's the fall christ as the second adam or the origins of sins now many some theistic evolutionists won't go that far but he's someone who's just been consistent who is taking evolution to its logical um, conclusion if you think about it, here you have God's perfect word and the theory of evolution, man's fallible opinion. When people try to make them agree, guess which one gets modified? It's never the theory of evolution. It's always God's holy word. God's perfect word is always what we try to modify. You know, in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul tells Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God. In other words, scripture finds its source in God. You know, Scripture is God breathed. It comes from God. It is his word. And Paul tells us that scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof and correcting and training in righteousness. And so if you hold to the doctrine of theistic evolutionists, then know that the word of God is there to correct your position and it's there to train you as well. It can correct not only your position, but it can train you in righteousness. And it, you, we need to understand that's what the word of God is there for. And then lastly, there's a problem with the gospel. And again, there are some theistic evolutionists out there today who will preach and teach the gospel. But I do believe that most theistic evolutionists have had to redefine the gospel because they're only being consistent with adding evolution to the scriptures. For example, Dr. Joseph Bankard on, uh, in, in an article on Biologus website called Substitutionary Atonement and Evolution said this, substitutionary atonement sees original sin as a major reason for Christ's death. But macroevolution calls the fall and the doctrine of original sin into question. Thus, evolution poses a significant challenge to substitutionary atonement. So that vital doctrine of the substitutionary nature of Christ's atonement, where he takes our sins upon him and where we get his righteousness when we trust in him, Bankard says that's, that, that doctrine has to go because of what we understand about evolution. You know, and Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it's a, it's a famous verse used to support the idea of substitutionary atonement in context. For our sake, Paul says, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's a beloved doctrine, the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement of Christ, where we gain Christ's righteousness when he takes our sinful nature um, away. And so we need to hold to that doctrine. But again, theistic evolutionists are saying, no, you have to get rid of that doctrine if you understand 
theory of evolution. And here's the thing. When you think about theistic evolution, you think about Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was not a theistic evolutionist. In fact, someone asked Darwin at the end of his life, a lawyer, a trained lawyer wrote to Darwin, asked him the question, what do you believe about the Bible? And what do you believe about scripture? And Darwin responded to that man, uh, Mr. McDermott. He said, I'm sorry to have to inform you that I do not believe in the Bible as a divine revelation and therefore not in Jesus Christ as the son of God. You know, Darwin was a clever man. He had a bachelor's degree in theology from Cambridge University. So he knew what the Bible said about creation and the fall and the flood. And he knew what the Bible said about Christ's work of redemption on the cross. But he rejected those things because he knew what he was set out, setting out to prove and disprove in his theory and he didn't put those things together he didn't say he was a theistic evolutionist in fact at the end of his life he described himself as an agnostic and here's the thing you need to know i'm not saying that all theistic evolutionists deny the gospel what i am saying when you understand the logical consequences it does away with the gospel theistic evolution isn't a way to reach people with the gospel. In fact, if you look at the church in the United Kingdom today, it's emptied the churches of people. It's emptied the church. It hasn't brought people to the church. It's emptied the church of the people that used to go to church. About 4% of the people in the United Kingdom go to church today, whereas in the 40s and 50s, there was at least 50% of people. Theistic evolution doesn't bring people into the church. It empties the church of people because it denies what the Bible teaches about creation, about fall, about the redemption and about the new heavens and new earth. And so we need to understand those things. We need to understand that you cannot say that God used evolution to create the world. That is incompatible with the teaching of scripture. Paul tells us lastly, in Colossians 2 8, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. I would say that if you describe yourself as a theistic evolutionist, someone has cheated you through the philosophy of man, through the philosophy of man, and not of the philosophy according to Christ, because if you believed what Christ believed, then you would believe in the biblical account of creation. So I would say to you, look at scripture again, look at what Christ teaches about these things, look at what Genesis states about the history of our world and hold to those things because they are the word of God. Anyway, let me quickly tell you of a few resources that are out there that'll be able to help you if you wanna know more. There's Ken Ham's book, the lie which shows you um, why theistic evolution does not go with the Bible. It tells you um, why the Bible um, is against the idea of evolution, that you can't put those two together. If you're looking for something about the days of creation from a lay perspective, this is a great book that Ken has written, looking at the, what the Bible says about creation and the different views that are out there in the church today, and he critiques those. Um, if you're looking for a book on the flood, Ken's edited with Bodie Hodge's son-in-law, a book called A Flood of Evidence. And it tells us what the Bible tells us about the flood, but also what we see in the world through observational science, which refutes um, millions of years of Earth history. And then I've written a book called Adam the First and the Last, responding to modern texts on Adam and Christ, again, dealing with this idea of theistic evolution. And then there's a great book called Glass House, shattering the myth of evolution and that will deal with the most common arguments that are put forth today by evolutionists for the theory of evolutionists and those ideas are debunked in that book and then last um, there's also a book called come into grips with genesis if you want to um, give a book to your pastor or even if you want to get a bit more technical uh, how to understand genesis then there's that great book come into grips with genesis but if you just want something small on this issue, I've written a pocket guide called What the New Testament Says About Creation. And again, open up a lot of doctrines in there to show us what the Bible tells us about these things. So I want to thank you for your time tonight. Thank you um, for listening to uh, this talk. And may um, God bless you this evening. <laughs>